Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second Lunchbox talk for this year's Research Week. We wish to acknowledge that the campuses of Ogum University are located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Muskegawak Cree, as well as hereditary lands of the Métis Nation. We also acknowledge that many of us are joining from Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, home of the, Gar home of the Garden River and Batchewana First Nations, on sacred lands set aside for education as envisioned by Chief Shinwalk for our children and for those as yet unborn. As today's session is being held virtually, we would also like to acknowledge all the Indigenous nations across Turtle Island, whose lands and territories we are each situated on. Um, just a couple housekeeping items before we uh, begin our presentations for today. Uh, this session will be recorded and will be linked to our AU Research Week website under the lunchbox talk section, that's no uh, Participant cameras and mics are off. Only hosts and panelists have camera and mic access. If you do run into any audio issues during the webinar, please try another method of listening in, such as your computer audio or calling in by phone. Uh, the chat and QA functions have been disabled at this time. And after each presentation, we will re-enable the Q&A. Each presentation will be followed by a five minute Q&A from our audience. Now, since we have such a short time frame, we do ask that you keep your questions brief so that we can get through as many as possible within the five minute window. Uh, we will follow up with any questions as time permits. Otherwise, a follow up email will be shared. Um, if you are a member of the media, please reach out via chat to set up an interview with our speakers and or the office of research. Um, we will begin this session today with Dr. Andrea Pinero, who is an Associate Professor of the Visual Arts and Music Department. Her presentation is on ecological and land-based research in studio art courses. And I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen and hand this all over to Andrea. Thank you, Ivana. Um, okay. Sorry, I just had to change the settings. First, I just wanted to thank um, Tiffany uh, for inviting me to create this uh, talk and share a little bit about the research that we're doing. Um, so I just wanted to start way back um, when I was a, a student at White Mountain Academy of the Arts in Elliott Lake, which is in this in the same Algoma region. Um, one of my my very first project in my first semester um, of art school was imagining and creating a plan for um, a series of plantings of trees that would become hyper accumulators on the uranium tailings. There's many of them around the Elliott Lake area. Um, to pull heavy metals and radionuclides out of the ground. So I was conceiving of this as um, both a, an art project, but, but an art project that engaged with the land in a healing capacity. Um, but since that time, most of my work was in images that represented the land or that engaged with um, how we think about perceive and relate to the land, but we're not necessarily um, we're not usually actually physically interacting with the land. Um, so a lot of my recent research has become more engaged with the land in a relational aspect. And that's translating into the studio work and the courses, I think in interesting ways. So um, in 2016, I began living in Searchmont, um, just Northeast of here and search months along the Gouli River, which is an area rich in many clay deposits. And throughout all of my uh, education in art school, um, I had worked with clay, um, also with part-time jobs working in clay studios. Uh, so it was really nice to start working with the land in that very direct, tangible way. And I wanted to just make uh, very you know, simple, simple pots um, out of clay to sort of learn the workability of it. Typically, uh, raw natural clay isn't as easily manipulated and worked with the same way that commercial clay that you would buy that's sort of refined and mixed to be more uh, workable. But I began working with it 
over a couple of years to sort of get a sense of what was needed to be able to get sort of relatively effective results and working with just simple pit fire methods. Um, and, and I was starting to do experiments with other ways of working with the clay, such as uh, creating screens to project 60 millimeter films onto. And another part of my practice is just sort of continually visiting these clay deposits, photographing them, um, observing them as they change throughout the seasons with the, the different melt and the different um, rain and, and dry cycles. There ends up being incredibly interesting sort of visual um, and visual and uh, sort of sculptural formations that appear on the clay. Uh, when I was on my sabbatical, I traveled to uh, Iceland, uh, Lisbon, the Azores, uh, and throughout much of the Southwest US. And in my sabbatical work, I was really wanting to think deeply about my own relationship to land as a settler here in Canada, first generation, um, to think about my relationship to the places that my parents were born that I had never been to visit until that year and and to other places like Iceland that were important to me but not this um, not connected through um, heritage or anything like that um, so I took some of my small pots with me and I began um, depositing them in different places that spoke to me in in different ways and the first was in Iceland and when I I took this little pot I I left it in a certain area that resonated with me. And then just a couple moments later, I was walking down along the shore and came upon uh, this, this sheep skeleton. And on the sheep were these two horns uh, that, that pulled off very easily. And I thought it was just such a profound reflection of, of how the earth is so immensely generous. And when we can make a small gesture of thanks or offering, um, it it gets, um, you know, it's just so multiplied back that generosity of the earth to us. Um, the the second and third places, or I think the set, other places that I deposited pots were in uh, Setsudades in the Azores where my father was born uh, and Graco in Lisbon. Um, and it was interesting observing like just the different soil types and humidity levels. There was a lot of drought in Europe that year. Um, but not in Iceland or the Azores. And then I deposited some at the edge of the Nevada test site um, when I went camping there and um, in the Shiprock uranium tailings uh, by Shiprock, New Mexico. Uh, following that, I developed a large scale sculpture on which I projected uh, 60 millimeter films that I had taken through my travels and of the Guli River. Uh, for an exhibition at the Thunder Bay Art Gallery. And this was an experiment in, in working with the local clay in a larger format. Uh, it wasn't fired, but it was, uh, it was packed onto a substrate or a form made out of uh, roots collected from the river as well. And the following summer in 2019, uh, I was lucky to have a student researcher, Desiree Watson, who assisted me with um, doing different tests with the clay, uh, gathering clay from different sites and comparing uh, their, their unfired colors to their fired colors and comparing much of their workability as well as setting up a very minimal clay studio that we could work with for a class that summer. Um, but this region is, you know, many of you probably know this region is very rich in clay. Um, all the different deposits have their own unique qualities. And, um, you know, there's just so much more work that we can do with, with testing and looking at the different clay deposits in the re region. So our, our first wild clay research course uh, was a ton of fun, uh, getting students out into the river to gather clay and we were able to do these sort of mini pit firings um, using fire pits on campus. And we did, I think, two or three firings, but they were a great way for the students to work together to learn how to work with the clay. And at the same time, uh, as we were doing this course, Paulette Steves was developing some preliminary trials to create a Northern Ontario terra preta, which is a form of 
soil amendment that was practiced in the Amazon and pre-Columbian times, uh, where clay shards and charcoal were integrated into the soil along with compost and, and uh, other organic matter. And the charcoal and the clay together have this incredible capacity to hold micronutrients in the ground, in the soil for much longer than otherwise would be the case, you know, in, in the range of thousands of years in terms of a difference. Uh, and they also act as a carbon sink and they can actually pull carbon from the atmosphere. So all of the, the extra clay left over from the students that did not, um, pieces that broke were then put into Paulette's gardens. And we also did a bunch of work uh, with, with my student assistant, Desiree, and Paulette students to create uh, even more clay shards to go into that garden. And the Terra Preta system method uh, also has a capacity to produce a much higher yield of, of food in a small garden space. And I just wanted to share some other work that students did with clay on their own following this. Um, Sam Pine Bennett became really interested in these concretions that form in the clay deposits. Uh, these were near Garden River and she collected uh, these these concretions uh, that she calls mud babies and use them to create cyanotypes, which is a type of uh, photographic, um, almost like a blueprint on fabric and, and integrating them into other sculptures. Uh, Desiree Watson used her clay pots to create these mini installations uh, that she called beauty feasts, uh, as well as making these really beautiful ephemeral gestures out on the land in some of the places where we collected clay, uh, where she would make small arrangements and photograph them, in, in also exploring her own relationship to the land, uh, as well as some of her more recent work, uh, taking the same clay gathered from the Guli River and trying to run it through a slab roller, which is a different way of forming clay into flat sheets. So every different method of forming the clay has different stresses on the clay. and you know, again, it's more challenging to work with this local clay, but finding uh, those ways of, of making that clay workable in that method uh, has to, can only really be done through, through doing it physically. So the, the students are helping a lot with that work. Um, these are just some of the images of the process of, of making terra preta. Uh, it, it definitely is not um, efficient or necessary to be making pots before smashing the clay and making it into clay shards. Um, but I really like the idea of adding that additional time and tension and care into the process. Uh, and often I will reduction fire my pots so they are packed into uh, a can with sawdust or other plant material around them. So that plant material in that reducing atmosphere ends up becoming charcoal and I end up with a black clay and the charcoal ready to go into the compost at the same time. And so I've been doing uh, work with this terra preta method of gardening at my home in Searchmont, which is really sandy, rocky, barely soil. Um, so it's been incredible to see how quickly uh, it helps to transform a relatively non-arable soil into an arable soil, of course, with compost added, um, but ideally, and hopefully it should be helping to retain those nutrients in the soil much longer. Uh, so the, this work has led me to think about how to develop some of this process into pieces that could become temporary artworks uh, before uh, becoming longer term soil amendments. And also thinking about, you know, what is the aesthetic value of uh, soil that has been regenerated, improved, cared for in this sort of sustainable, um, very holistic way. So one of the projects I'm planning to do this summer is to create these uh, woven soil amendment tapestries that will be comprised of um, roots gathered from trees along the river, uh, clay shards, chicken feathers, uh, sheep wool, um, some human hair, um, and charcoal bits. So the, it will allow those um, components to be sort of displayed as a visual form. And in one of the projects I'm planning to 
create one of these mats uh, planted in one of the sites uh, just north of where I live, uh, where they actually had done preliminary digs for uranium mining uh, along the Guli River. Luckily, that mine uh, was never fully realized. Um, but I'm planning to plant some spiderwort um, in those sites. And the spiderwort is a really interesting plant because uh, its stamens will actually change color in the presence of uh, gamma radiation from uh, blue to pink. So it's one of the few, few species that, that has this sort of immediate physical reaction to um, a radioactive environment. So th this is just a concept sketch, but it's very much how I imagine some of them will look. And um, this is just sort of in between the, the two projects, but um, in, in our sort of move to work with more natural materials in much of our studio practice, um, I have begun developing my black and white photographs using compost, um, compost combined with uh, citric acid and soda ash um, can develop any uh, black and white photographs quite well. And I do also have to credit uh, a previous student uh, who was here a couple of years ago, who was initially doing some experiments with coffee um, and citric acid to develop photographs. So um, it's nice that we can, you know, eliminate more of the more harmful chemicals from the studio. Uh, and more recently, we've been doing work with making our own inks and dyes. So in our visual fundamental courses, we've been making charcoal to make uh, ink to paint with and draw with uh, that would function similarly to a standard India ink and also using other materials such as uh, turmeric in this image it's being modified with soda ash to change it from a, a brilliant yellow to a red and we've also been using uh, shaggy mane or ink tap mushrooms to make a nice drawing ink. Um, I've been growing Hopi black dye uh, sunflowers. And in, in the summer when they're uh, just fresh, they create this like really incredible intense color on your hands and will dye cloth a really beautiful blue in the summer. And the, the stored seeds will make a really nice purple ink in the fall. And there's a, no, a number of other plants that I'm, I'm working to start growing uh, that work really well as dyes, but there's also a tremendous amount of um, native plants in the area that also can make many or a really wide range of dyes and colors. Um, so these are some of, there's tons of experiments done with uh, the mushroom ink and charcoal um, for, for using, you know, basic drawing ink. And in the fundamentals courses, the first year courses, I would have students use those inks to, to experiment with mark making and then import the inks into uh, or the ink drawings into Photoshop and then use them to create layered compositions and experiment with sort of visual, visual design. Uh, we also made a lot of our own brushes too. So this, this gets around some of the challenges that we have uh, being further away from a major center and having easy access to many art supplies. Uh, but I also, in my, in my experience as a student, learning in Elliott Lake, we, we made a lot of our own charcoal as well. And I know much of my desire to study art in Northern Ontario was based on that desire to want to learn to make my own materials. <clears throat> uh, this summer I began doing um, some eco printing, which is uh, a method of directly printing plants onto fabric and layering those over digital prints on silk. So that process got me thinking a lot more about uh, plant plants as uh, color sources and image sources. And there had been students who had previously worked in this as well. And I was thinking about how often we've had students who've worked with textiles in various ways. And uh, instead of having to have those students do work with textiles through like the independent projects, designing some courses that would actually support that work while I was exploring it uh, in my own work as well. Oh, sorry, Tiffany. Um, okay, I'm just about done. So uh, more recently we are um, 
making our own, own inks for printing lino cuts, relief cuts, uh, and printing them onto fabric. And we're finding that they're working really wonderfully for screen printing. So using uh, plants that we've collected or other uh, sustainable dye materials. And again, some upper year students, Helen and Helen Pru and Desiree Watson doing larger works with natural dyes and printing. And our last project, we're going to be kind of bringing, bringing the two processes, processes together, uh, printing with clay in a process called Dabu printing that originates in Indri India, uh, where we'll be using a, a clay slip to create resist prints onto cloth before dipping the cloth in indigo to create a blue dye. So that's all, thank you. Um, so Narosha, um, I'm not creating my own silk. That's a whole other uh, step um, that would be really interesting to get into. Um, we have been, I know some, some students are sourcing silk that is more ethical where the, the silkworms um, are allowed to leave the cocoons naturally. Um, but silk, Silk definitely has a lot of properties that react with color and natural dyes very differently than cotton, but for the most part in the courses we're using cotton. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something we would like to be more involved in making the substrates as well that we're printing onto. Not sure if there's any more questions. I don't see any in the Q&A. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea, for sharing with us not only your work, but that of your students. It's absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to our second presenter today. And it is Dr. Yui Tang. And she's an assistant professor in the School of Computer Science and Technology. Julie holds an NSERC discovery grant that she was awarded just this past year. The presentation she is sharing with us today is entitled, When Artificial Intelligence Meets the Internet of Vehicles. And I will uh, pass this over to you now. Okay, can you guys see my slides and hear me clearly? Yes, we can, Yitzi. Okay, that's great. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today with this talk. Um, today, I'm going to briefly introduce you an exciting field of research, and that is when artificial intelligence meets the Internet of Vehicles. Here's an outline of this talk. Uh, I will answer four basic questions in this research field. At the very beginning, I'm going to talk about what is the Internet of Vehicles. Uh, we call it IOV for short, and what are the basic components in it. Then we are going to answer why do we need the IOV by taking a look at the benefits from this technology. Followed by that, we are going to focus on how does the IOV work by exploring how vehicles are connected together and communicate with each other. In the end, we will take a look at how AI technologies can be leveraged to address technical challenges in IOV. Uh, to get started, let's first take a look at what a future wireless network would look like. Future wireless uh, networks will support diverse services, such as high quality video streaming, big data cloud storage, and augmented reality games. Future wireless networks utilize small spectrum of frequency band for communication. We know for decades, the cellular telephone system has 
continually growing in adoption and has evolved from simple calling and messaging to an enabling technology for universal wireless connectivity. For example, 2G and 3G cellular networks operated at 850 megahertz and 1900 megahertz. And as involved, additional frequency bands were included as spectrum around 2100 megahertz. Then the 4G LTE technologies adopted additional spectrum and frequency bands, namely around 600 megahertz, 7 mega, uh, 700 megahertz, 2.3 and 2.5 gigahertz. Then the 5G, what we are going to have in the future. So for 5G, frequency bands plans are much more complex. It spans from 450 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. And uh, we also adopt a media wave uh, communications in 5G, which have the frequency bands from 24 gigahertz to 52 gigahertz. We say that we have even much higher frequency bands adopted in the 5G communications. In addition, future wireless uh, network needs to integrate here heterogeneous access technologies and enable the interoperation among multiple existing wireless network deployments. For example, right now, you may be familiar with the cellular networks, which we have the connection to the uh, towers, like the, our data on our cell phone. And we also have the Wi-Fi networks. So in the future, we are going to interoperate among those existing network topologies. IOV is one of the revolutions mobilized by IoT. And IOV is evolving from vehicular ad hoc networks. We call it VNet for short. In general, a conventional VNet aims to achieve the vision from smartphone to smart car and enable cars to form wireless connections with other vehicles and devices. And IOV empowers vehicles to communicate with the surrounding environment and remote servers, such as uh, neighboring cars, roadside infrastructures, and traffic control centers. Also, we can also have the connection with the cloud or edge computing servers, enabling a wide range of on-the-go services, including the road safety, infotainment, and intelligent transportation. And as cities grow more inclusive towards smart vehicles, IOV helps shape the infrastructure that will allow automated cars to become fully autonomous in the not too distant future. So we may all familiar with the autonomous car, right? So the stage before we fully utilize the autonomous car, that's the internet of vehicles. Internet of vehicles can assist the development of autonomous, uh, autonomous cars. And all the smart cars in the IOV must have a reliable connection to the local infrastructure, all to other vehicles and uh, also the humans nearby. The following pieces of IOVs are necessary to ensure the smooth and safe functioning of the system. The first one is hardware. It's known as like the sensors. In IOV, like smart parking lots and road links are equipped with devices for connectivity. Even the smart traffic lights, variables for uh, humans and the hardware inside each vehicle. These hardwares are very important components for the IOV. And the next one is software. It's also important. They're referred to as uh, object recognition systems, mobile applications for pedestrians and other services required to connect the hardware pieces. Uh, in addition, the networking technologies are also necessary. So in future LV, we can not only use a 5G to perform communication, but we can also use a Bluetooth, a Wi-Fi, or the DSRC the dedicated short-range communication, um, communication protocol 
which is designed, dedicated for the vehicle networks. And also we can use other um, formats to create vehicular communication connections. And uh, the third party and additional services are also needed, such as uh, GPS, data analytics, and apps to moni uh, monitor the weather, road condition, and the other services based on the person's locations. So those are all the necessary components in IOV. Now let's take a closer look at uh, what the LV means for cities and the commuters and what are the major benefits of the IOV. So that's the, all the reasons why we want to uh, develop the IOV for us. The reasons are uh, the followings. With the help of IOV, we can increase the safety of the transportation. One of the great, uh, greatest or largest improvements uh, of IOV is that it can offer and providing much more accurate and rapid assessment of any situation on the road. Um, there's a report from the US National Highway Traffic Safety Administration states that almost 40, uh, sorry, 94% of road accident occur due to human error. And some of them are virtually impossible to eliminate. So the inclusion of sensors and cameras, both inside and outside the vehicle, have enabled several safety features to be incorporated in passenger cars, such as we can implement a blind spot detection, adaptive crucial control, and the emergency braking. All of those can be implemented in IOV to help us to get a safer transportation. And uh, in, in addition to removing human error, the above systems can also monitor the condition of the various mechanical parts of the smart car and alert drivers of any potential malfunctions before accidents can occur. LV can also benefit faster travel and convenience. The internet of connected vehicles makes transmit faster and improves users' experience dynamically. A smart transportation infrastructure mainly helps achieve the followings. First, with the help of LV, there's decreased congestion on the road. In LV, real-time traffic monitoring and autonomous technology coupled together help optimize the routes and speeds of moving vehicles to prevent traffic jams. And second, IOV can also help us optimize routes. For example, mobile apps that receive real-time data from each user's location can suggest that public transport to which public transport to take. And this way, in this way, it can cut the travel time down for the customers. Uh, next, better parking. So for the IOV clients, Smart parking is one of the most desired features for, of the infrastructure. Beacons installed at parking spaces. Beacons are the very short information that can transmit from the infrastructure to the uh, surrounding users. Those beacons can lead drivers to vacate spots where completely autonomous vehicles can park efficiently without any human interventions. And the next benefit is the remote, remote car management. Smart cars that are visible on the network allow drivers to find their vehicles faster in a crowded parking lot. Like they can lock doors remotely, get any information about the condition of the car quickly and track the car if someone steals it. Uh, so all those things can help us to protect our cars. And the next one is uh, infotainment, uh, infotainment, sorry, infotainment. IOV technology will be redefine the exceptions that drivers and customers currently have when it comes to entertainment in the car. 
as cities become more prepared to integrate fully autonomous cars, the, the available entertainment options for customers will expand since people won't have to pay attention to the road anymore. And uh, as far as I know, until now, Toronto have some uh, launched some projects that they build the infrastructures, uh, which is friendly for the autonomous cars. And the next major benefit is the environmental benefits. By optimizing the functioning of the transportation system, IOV technology can also have several incredibly beneficial impacts on the environment. Cities will see the largest influence on the reduction of like carbon dioxide emissions and the promotion of a more sustainable energy future. And the connected vehicles will cut down the greenhouse gas emissions by operating more efficiently. Also, car crashing and uh, are, sorry, car sharing and the use of public transport are likely to increase once it becomes as comfortable and fast as using a private car. And this will reduce the number of vehicles on the roads, further turning down the harmful environment impacts. So those are all the benefits of the IOV. And the, so, so that the smart transportation can also optimize the use of fuel, electricity, and the human resources. Uh, for instance, conventional traffic lights work on timers using more electricity and providing less efficiency than smart lights that adjust to the situation on the road. So to sum up, the main goal of the IOV is to make both transportation and the vehicle maintenance process more efficient, safe, inclusive, and environmental friendly. Next, let's take a look at how does IOV technology work. The main working principle of IOV technology is connecting smart cars and infrastructure units. To achieve that, manufacturers install the hardware and the software necessary for the internet and other kinds of local connections in each vehicle. Most of the crucial systems are inbuilt, while many others can be plugged into the on-fault diagnosis. There's a plug-in space that if we want to use such kind of features, we can plug in our devices, then we can have those features uh, as necessary. And the heterogeneous network architecture of IOV includes five types of vehicular communications. And the types include the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. We call them V2V communication. That means we can have the vehicles communicate with other vehicles and the vehicle to infrastructures of mobile networks. That means we can have the vehicles connected to the surrounding infrastructures, like the base stations, the cell towers, or we can have the vehicles communicate with the surrounding uh, roadside units. And also we can have the vehicle to personal device, V2P connections. And we can also have the vehicle to cloud, connections. So for the vehicle to um, V2P connections, it refers to the communication between the vehicles and personal devices, such as the uh, smartphones of pedestrians. So with the V2P communications in IoT, vehicles can communicate with the pedestrians on the road. And for the V2C communications, it allows the vehicles to to access additional information from the internet through application program interfaces. That means we can have the API to have the communication between the vehicles on the road to the cloud servers. And the last type is the V2S, vehicle to sensors. It refers to the communication between the sensors in the intro vehicle subnet network. So that means within the a vehicle, we may have multiple sensors, and those sensors 
can communicate with each other to um, exchange the information among them. And usually we call all this about five communication types in IOV as a V2X. That means vehicle to everything. Vehicle can talk to everything. No matter they are the devices or the people, vehicles can communicate with anything in the world. And to better support IOV, various networks like the terrestrial networks, uh, aerial network and the satellite networks, those are all uh, integrated in IOV. And uh, also we need to consider the heterogeneous resources like the communication resources, what we are using for communicate like the spectrum bands and the computing resources, how we can process the uh, tasks which are generated from the vehicles and the, also the storage resources which are used to catch some files uh, for the vehicles. Those are expected to be integrated to provide service to vehicles anywhere and anytime. So in such a dynamic and a complex scenario, many technical challenges arise, like high mobility of vehicles, various network dynamics, um, stringent of service requirements, multidimensional randomness, great heterogeneous networks, and et cetera. So do we have a solution to address those challenges? The answer is yes. Artificial intelligence has great potential to address these technical challenges and manage heterogeneous resources efficiently. It's desirable to apply advanced AI, artificial intelligence techniques, and the data science and the distributed computing to make the network more intelligent to meet the various requirements of ultra low latency and high reliability. Uh, and it can also help us to achieve the seamless wide area coverage, high capacity hotspot, massive connections, and so on. So how AI, the artificial intelligence technology can help us, it can, it, uh, so AI have been gaining more and more popularity for innovative and high performance data driven strategies in intelligent transportation systems. When it comes to dealing with the sophisticated traffic information in IOV, creative AI approaches can be leveraged to take responsibility for multi-dimensional data processing and computing tasks. Recent AI technologies that have been applied for vehicle traffic scheduling include reinforcement learning, artificial neural networks, and multi-agent systems. The diverse algorithms in the reinforcement learning, ANN, artificial neural networks, and the MAS can be employed separately or jointly. It depends on the particular problem and solution. So for this multi-agent system is, comp uh, is composed of multiple interacting intelligent agents and the multi-agent systems can solve problems that are difficult or impossible for an individual agent to solve. Intelligence may include algorithm search or reinforcement learning for this multi-agent system. And the reinforcement learning is a process of decision-making it's about learning the optimal behavior in an environment to obtain maximum reward. We see the agent connect, uh, sense the environment and make the decisions. And those actions will come back to the environment and they will generate the new states and generate a new reward which comes to the agent. And in this process, the agent can obtain the multiple solutions it was similar to the children exploring the world around them and learning the actions that help them achieve a goal. And ANN is a computational model that mimics the way the nerve cells work in the human brain. And ANs use learning algorithms that can independently make adjustments or learn. 
uh, once the new input was coming to the network. So here's a study case, a uh, case study for the uh, non-signalized intersection management. We can have, we, we can use uh, aforementioned three strategies to solve the non-signalized uh, intersection management problem. So for the reinforcement learning algorithm, we trace or model each vehicle as an individual agent. And for each vehicle, they will calculate the optimal decision based on the sensing of the environment and make their own decisions to achieve their maximum goal. And this way is a distributed way. And we can also use the ANN uh, strategy to solve the problem. So we are going to have a, like a coordinator here, which is substitute the traffic light. Then this in, uh, infrastructure will generate the decisions for those individual vehicles. So th this is a centralized way. And we can also use a multi-agent case. That means we treat each, uh, each base station as an agent. And those base stations can have the communication with each other and they make the decision jointly. Okay, so that's all the uh, three strategies to solve the non-synchronized case for the IOV. Okay, so that's all for my uh, presentation. Thank you, you see. A little bit Thank you, Yutsi. We'll Sorry. open it up to Q&A now. Uh, we do have three that came in through um, the Q&A chat. Uh, the first one is from Narosha. And her question is, what are your thoughts on the possibility of AI on making decisions autonomously without human input? Are there mechanisms in place to prevent this? Okay. So for the um, when we make decisions using AI, um, we actually need some kind of human input. So based on some kind of human input, we perform the training and uh, have the interaction with the surrounding environment to make decision. So um, we cannot see. Um, we couldn't. We we couldn't make decisions without human input. Uh, if you are referring to the um, autonomous cars, um, indeed, we don't. We don't have a uh, human input, but we have some sensors which can acquire the informations within the cars or within the surroundings. So that way, we can have a more accurate decision for the IOV. Thank you. Um, she's got a follow-up question as well. If you have an IOV connected to the same source, would this not allow for easy hacking then control over all the text attached to it? How do you add a level of security to this? Yeah, that's a good question. So for IOV, um, the security is a very important issue. Since we know that uh, for IOV, all the things are connected together this definitely will cause some private issue or there are some uh, attackers to attack the system. So actually there are a lot of research related to the security in the IOV, mm, but uh, my research area is out of this scope. And uh, this uh, indeed is a very important issue in IOV and lots of researchers have working on that. Thanks. Um, we have another question from uh, Miguel Garcia Rios. And his question is why IOV may reduce car CO2 emissions? Yeah, so thanks for your question. Um, because, you know, for the IOV in the future, we may have the uh, uh, electricity cars. That means uh, we don't need to have the cars with gas. We can have the um, car empowered by electricity. That's one way we can reduce uh, uh, carbon dioxide. And uh, the other reason is that because in the future for IOV, we can manage the uh, networks more efficiently. 
and uh, we can um, direct the cars with the optimal routes for them. So in this way, they can uh, have a more efficient travel. That's why we can also reduce the uh, um, carbon dioxide emissions. Thank you, Yutsi. Um, we might have time for one more question and here it comes. Um, the next question is, is there any contingency plans? Should these systems be cut off the grid? Is there a sustainable way to ensure these aren't vulnerable to electric failures? Uh, that's also a good question. Yeah, so in the future, there are some research areas uh, launched the research related to the green communications. That means we can not only have the electric um, empowered cars, may, we can may also consider the mixed waste, like the if we can uh, adopt uh, uh, wind powers or the sun, uh, sunlight powers to um, motivate our cars. Yeah, this, uh, this also is a, another research area for IOV. Yes, this concludes our Q&A for UTC today. And uh, thank you, UTC, for speaking on such an interesting topic and what continues to be a major part of our, our lives now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this now brings us to our third and final speaker for today. Um, a big welcome to Dr. Newsray Aziz, who returns to our Lunchbox Talks this year. News Rate is an associate professor in the School of Business and Economics, and his presentation today is entitled The Northern Ontario Tourism Development and Recovery Strategy. Welcome, Dr. News Rate. Hello, everyone. Thanks, uh, Ivana. And I must thank Nirusha and Tiffany for inviting me to present my work. So this is actually a collaborative work. I have my co-investigator, Dr. Sean Mates, and a researcher, Dr. Taman Narimi. And we had a research assistant, Graham Slater. Um, this research was funded by Shark Institutional Grant. Uh, I cannot actually um, present all the work, all the findings we received, we found from this study. I, I'm going to actually uh, focus on COVID-19 and um, its impact on the Northern Ontario tourism. So why we became interested in this uh, study, in this survey, Actually, uh, global tourism has survived four pandemics in the 21st century. Uh, and all those pandemics hit the tourism industry, but none led to a longer term decline in tourism growth. So this COVID-19 pandemic, that was different and uh, it has a long lasting effect due to its wider reach and severity. And uh, we, we, we thought that might significantly change human behavior towards uh, travel and tourism. So as a result, many travelers might reconsider the nature and distance of travel. So there, there was some papers published on that. I just give an example uh, that was published uh, there, uh, by Oliver uh, Wayman, 2020, who found that during the pandemic, Chinese travelers preferred uh, domestic destinations and uh, personal transportation to travel and were willing to spend more on tourism, especially on food and local experiences. So uh, we became interested in this uh, research and we focused on Northern Ontario. So we conduct a survey to see the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the Northern Ontario tourism industry. Uh, a little background about Northern, Ont Northern Ontario tourism. Uh, here I'm comparing with uh, Ontario, uh, you know, Northern Ontario with Ontario. When I 
uh, you see the international tourists over time from 1990 to 20, 21st, 21. And you see, uh, I excluded Susan Mary's uh, value. Susan Mary, I, I must say here, is uh, the major tourist destination. When you talk about Northern Ontario, Susan Mary is covering uh, almost or more than 90% of it. So um, international tourists, uh, you see the line and you see the Canadian tourists uh, to Northern Ontario, uh, to, to the Ontario as a whole. And then at the bottom, you see two lines. Uh, one is black, another is green. These are actually Northern Ontario tourism. So if you compare, I, here you see, mind the gap, 90% landmass is in Northern Ontario, and we receive you know, just very insignificant amount, number of tourists uh, who we actually host here. And uh, COVID-19, of course, uh, had impact on uh, Ontario tourism, as well as Northern Ontario tourism. In detail, you see the Sault Ste. Mary's and, uh, give me a second, uh, let me take it. So, So um, composition of, uh, based on the origin of tourism, you see the international travelers uh, is at the top. And then we have Canadian uh, travelers and US travelers there uh, in Northern Ontario, right? So uh, oh, in Sault Ste. Mary particularly, uh, I excluded actually the other part of Northern Ontario because that's very insignificant number. So uh, say in 2020s, uh, in 2000, you see that uh, Canadian internal tourism or uh, local local uh, domestic tourists, number of local uh, domestic tourists came in Northern Ontario and US tourists came in Northern Ontario, they were almost same, right? And you see the uh, last part, you know, in, in this area, circled area, you see uh, we've, we have uh, only, you know, local tourists here. Uh, not international tourists, you see it's almost zero. Okay. Slide. Uh, you see the Northern Ontario in this slide and um, 13B is actually Sault Ste. Mary or Algoma district area and the rest are 13C, 13A, these are other part of Northern Ontario. And you see the tail, if you consider this is a big fish and the tail is the Southern Ontario uh, who receives most of, uh, you, know, you know, tourists. So this is, uh, this part is Ontarian tourists who came in 2019, if you compare with 2020. So uh, it, it was uh, 14, 48 millions and then compared to that, 14 millions in Ontario. In Sault Ste. Mary, you see 1 million, more than a million, and uh, you see 277,000 uh, in 2020, if you compare. So a significant decrease uh, during COVID uh, pandemic. Some statistics for, I think, useful to understand. Uh, so one out of every four businesses in North is tourist, tourism related. 40% of the workforce is connected to tourism and international visitors, as you saw, that uh, are more than domestic tourists. And the 77% of US visitors come from border cities, border states. And 40% of Ontario visitors to Northern Ontario reside in Northern Ontario. Majority uh, non-Ontarian visitors come from Manitoba and Winnipeg. Uh, at a regular year, like in 2026, uh, 2016, uh, we saw 8.7 million visitors in Northern Ontario and 1.59 billion revenue earned uh, from tourism industry. So this is our study. This is our study you see, um, uh, we surveyed actually two groups of uh, respondents. One is the demand side, another is the su uh, supply side. So we, we actually uh, surveyed uh, the invest uh, visitors and the tourist, 
tourism operators like uh, you know entrepreneurs. So um, we had 420 samples collected and 335 from them are the respondents uh, from, from visitor side or demand side and 85 respondents are from operator side. And our sampling was snowballs, emailing, and um, like our uh, partners, like Destination Northern Ontario, Algoma Country, uh, Tourism, Sault Ste. Mary, and others, they actually helped us uh, to, you know, uh, to, to in this process to collect, uh, we collected data through them. All right. Uh, so, the sample period is from April 2021 to July 2021. Uh, you see that period, uh, it was heavily restricted for international tourists. And some, there were a lot of restrictions for domestic tourists as well. So survey captures tourism during uh, pandemic, first part of pandemic, uh, April 2020 to June 2021. So for a year or a little bit more like uh, 13, 14 months. Due to pandemic, our study does not represent a regular international tourism flow that occurs in a normal situation. So uh, we had two types of visitors. 83% uh, uh, we received response from um, repeated visitors and 17% uh, we received from new visitors. Okay, so um, some demographics, you see uh, more than 72% visitors are 52 years of age or above. Uh, who visit Northern Ontario we, within our sample. Uh, we found that. And a considerable 50% less between those who are aged 32 to 41 and those who are 22 to 31. And you see a, a bias distribution. If you look at its rightward distribution, so this is the, this is the uh, uh, year of birth uh, in the horizontal axis. And um, visitors visited during April, uh, our, our survey period, they, they are, we found that 48% visitors uh, annual income are more than 100,000 per year. And then 71% had a post-secondary degree. Why it's not moving, okay. Okay, so uh, this is supply side information. So the uh, business, they informed us, I mean, their, their data shows that uh, the number one visitors come in Northern Ontario from Ontario. Um, if you set, like, if you classify like, uh, like US states and Canadian provinces uh, in that uh, we, we find uh, Ontario is the top and then Michigan, but uh, as you saw in the figure in, in, the, uh, in my previous slides, international visitors are more than domestic visitors for sure. But uh, if you separate, like if you compare with the states and the provinces, you see you know, Ontario is the top and then Michigan, then Ohio. Uh, Ohio. Um, so these are the region of visitors, uh, home region of the uh, of visitors uh, in like during pandemic. So Northern Ontarian visited uh, Northern Ontario is 38% and um, followed by 22% like Southwestern Ontarians and then um, Eastern Ontarians, cent uh, Central Ontarians and Eastern Ontarians and others. So others are from other provinces. And more than 68% of tourists visited Algoma, Sudbury, and Nipissing districts. And uh, uh, among them, you see 35% are from Algoma. Uh, they came to Algoma, actually. These are the destinations I'm talking about. Uh, the, you know, spring and summer, spring, summer, and partially fall time is the time when uh, visitors visit Northern Ontario, 85, 84% visit from April to October. So the winter activities and, you know, winter cannot attract uh, uh, Northern Ontario, cannot attract the visitors actually to Northern Ontario a lot. And then if we talk about um, like 
So what kind of activities they do, I don't want to cover a lot. We, ha we have actually a lot of findings. I, I don't want to cover this part. So 70% took part in outdoor activities. That's what I can share with you. So what is the impact of COVID-19? That's important in this case. Uh, so over 78 had to change travel plan. 90% new visitors had changed their plan due to pandemic, which was positive for Northern Ontario. Uh, I will explain that in a minute. So 76% travelers plan were impacted by travel restrictions, border closure, government restrictions, and others. And 61% uh, indicated health concern and fear. And 32% um, were impacted by travel cancellation and 34% changed plan of visiting elsewhere. Uh, instead visited Northern Ontario. So overall 31% plan to travel internationally who changed their mind and visited Northern Ontario and 32% had shortened their travel distance and visited on Northern Ontario. So like, you know, COVID-19 pandemic actually helped a little bit. Uh, you, you'll see uh, when we sum it up, we see the loss, we lost more visitors than we gained. But due to COVID, uh, people couldn't travel internationally and other provinces, so they visited uh, Northern Ontario. That was only positive side here. Okay, so this is the supply, uh, you know, this is operator side. So the average year we see uh, 2,680 while we receive, I mean, with the during time, the, during winter, we received 2,680 visitors. Uh, but during pandemic, we received 50% uh, less. So similarly, in the spring, we see 90%, 92, 3% drop. And uh, in the summer, 72% drop. So all negatives you see uh, during pandemic. So that, that is the impact. And it impacted, mention about that, the profitability as well, right? It's not only the number, it, it is actually profitability and revenue. So, uh, these are the different types of impact um, they felt, the operators felt. And um, this is actually among those who experienced a decline in revenue. So 51% experienced more than 50% decline in revenue. 21% uh, indicated a decline between 26% to 50%. And the challenge that they face, uh, face 76% operators uh, indicates profit profitability will likely to be a challenge in the future. And 64% operators ex uh, expect attracting travelers to return would be challenging for them. And other challenges are how to safely operate during the pandemic. 56% says that having enough operating uh, cash to restart marketing during and after pandemic and rehiring staff. And a big one is border closure affects actually uh, Northern Ontario tourism a lot. So these are the challenges for the future. And um, so how they will face these challenges, 47% are planning to adapt business operations to new normal, 31% are planning to innovate further and innovations include um, improved cleaning, measures, crowd control, invest in outdoor dining, those, those, those things, you know, digital strategy, adapting to needs or requirements by the consumers uh, and expand uh, the area that worked well during the pandemic. So actually uh, we are still doing our work. We are not yet done. We are going to apply actually the gravity model which talks about uh, the distance matter. And uh, we will also talk, about, uh, we will ex investigate uh, in the, uh, and based on the theories like economic geography theories of tourism and evolutionary theory of tourism uh, development. So that work is from me from for now. Uh, we have actually a lot to share, but we don't have time to share now. Thanks a lot for giving me the, this opportunity. Thank you, News Rate. Uh, we're going to open it up now for the Q&A. And we do have two questions that have come forward. The first one is from Narosha. And her question is, is tourism impacted by access to natural resources like lakes, forests for camping, hiking, etc.? I suspect Sault Ste. Marie is in a great location for access to these resources and should not be impacted by global pandemics. 
What are your thoughts? Uh, um, okay. So the question is, students impacted by access to natural resources like lakes, forests, uh -huh. Yeah, but the, so if we consider uh, more than 50%, say 60% uh, international tourists, if directly is not impacting here, but the, the, of course there is impact from international uh, border and restrictions and this and that. But in the future, because the type of restrictions are different now, I, I believe uh, it will not affect a lot. And her, she has another question, and it is, why do you think people from Ohio are coming to Northern Ontario when they are geographically so very far? Do the visitor population include people who come for employment or leisure? Okay, many reasons actually found why they visit. Actually, one of them is they visit their parents and family. And uh, of course, uh, outdoor activities and food, so many things. And people like, you know, um, tourists, you know, tourist psychology, they, they, if they visit this year, this place, they want to visit the other place uh, the next year. So there are so many reasons. Um, why is not that far? You know, people are coming from China, from Europe, many other places. So um, uh, the only thing is needed is the information availability. We need to inform the tourists that uh, this is a really great place to visit. Are there any more questions? I Thank you for those questions. Yet. Oh, and there, we do have one more. And this is from Brad and Amanda from Thrive Tours. As a new Indigenous owned and operated tourism business in Sault Ste. Marie called Thrive Tours, we certainly have been challenged by the restrictions, but chose to generate new business by combining traditional ecological stewardship and innovative new clean technologies in the future. Miigwech for all your research. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, you, you're, you're, you're right. You're, you're right, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank Andrea, UC and Newsrate for presenting their research with us today. Uh, there was quite a variety of research presented to us and it's always great for our faculty to be able to share their research with the AU community. Um, as we conclude for today, just a reminder that our town hall is tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., followed by our third and final lunchbox talk at 12 p.m. to wrap up research week. Thank you again for joining today, and we hope to see everyone tomorrow. Thank you.